Good morning. Wow, there's so many people standing. <laughs> Our call to worship this morning. Please join me responsibly. The earth is the Lord's and all that is in it, the world and those who live in it. For God has founded it on the seas and established it on the rivers. Those who have clean hands and pure hearts, who do not live up their souls to what is false and do not swear deceitfully. Let us, let us worship God. Please join me in singing our opening hymn as we stand together if you are able. It's lovely. We can all sing together. I can see your faces. <laughs> as we gather at your table, as we listen to your word, help us know. Your presence, let our hearts and minds be stirred. Nourish us with sacred story till we claim it as our own. Teach us through this holy banquet how to make love's victory known. Turn our worship. sacrament of life. Send us forth to love and serve you, bringing peace where there is strife. Give us Christ your great compassion to forgive as you forgive. May we still behold your Spirit, help us summon other guests to share that feast. Where triumphant love will welcome those who have been last and least. There no more will envy bind us, nor will pride our peace destroy. As we join with saints and angels to repeat the sounding joy. Please be seated. God greets us and we greet each other. I invite you to share a sign of peace with your neighbor in whatever way is comfortable for both of you. The peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Our call to confession this morning. By nature, we are more like the two who passed by the beaten man on the other side of the road rather than the good Samaritan. Christ, in his mercy, has rescued us from the powers of darkness with forgiveness and redemption. He wants to hear our open and honest confession so that we know our weaknesses. Let's confess before God and each other with our prayer of confession. Lord, sometimes we are confused. We hear the bad news continually shouted on TV, radio, newspapers, and magazines. The whole world seems to be shrieking in pain. Innocent people are being destroyed by the whims of the wicked. Disease and pestilence reign supreme in too many parts of the world. We turn an indifferent ear to the cries of others. Often we are so overwhelmed by the needs, 
feel helpless in the face of such chaos. We close our eyes. We walk away, often crossing over to the side of self-importance and indifference because we are afraid to become involved. Our society is quick to sue and slow to heal. We succumb to those pressures in our fear. Help us, O Lord. Heal our spirits as well as our bodies. Open our hearts and our eyes to see you, O Christ, that we may be empowered to service rather than apathy. Forgive us, Lord, forgive us. Make us ready to truly become your disciples. For we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Do not be afraid. God's love is reaching out to you to touch your hurt and wounds and to provide healing. Receive God's blessing and be assured of God's eternal love for you. Amen. Please stand. be seated. It's time for the children's message. So all of you children come up front. Corey, you can be a child today. Okay, good morning. Um, as I was preparing to teach you guys about this important task yeah, um, that Jesus has for us, it made me think of the mail. So I brought my mail with me today because I forgot to get it yesterday. And I got a package here for Jaden. So she's gonna be really excited about that. Something she's been waiting for, I'm sure. I got an invitation to a grad party this year, so it's always fun when you get mail and get an invitation to a party. I got an invitation to a wedding, super fun. I love going to weddings. And Max got his diploma. So I know he's gonna be really excited to receive his diploma. Now, do you guys like to all get mail, right? It's exciting to get packages and get news and Christmas cards and so much information is passed through the mail. So that just made me think of the post office and all the mail carriers and what an important job they have to make sure that we get all of our invitations and bills, which aren't so fun, and just all the inf information that they spread literally throughout the world. And I thought of what would happen if the post workers and all the mail carriers didn't deliver the mail. You know, we would have so much information that's not being spread, which ties to the great commission and command that Jesus gave us as his disciples. Spreading that information, getting that news out to everyone. And I thought, wow, if we thought every day when we saw a mail carrier or we went by the post office, what an important job they have and how they're required to do it. You know, the, the mail never stops, right? Rain, sleet, hail, snow, it, it comes and, and it's their job and they're required. And I thought, 
let's think of ourselves as also being those mail carriers. I, like we can't wake up one day if we work in the post office and say, hey, I'm not gonna deliver the mail today, right? I don't feel like it. Well, let's think of ourselves then as those mail carriers, as people every day, even maybe when we aren't feeling like spreading God's word. It was that great command from Jesus to do that. And I was thinking of different ways that we could do that. So what are some ways that you guys think we could be his disciples and spread that, spread that news? Sure. Talk to people. I know Pastor Jim says all the time, invite people to church. Um, send those cards and letters out, just letting people know that you're thinking about them and just being their friend and being kind, especially in this world today with so much animosity, just that smile and hello and, and looking different. So again, as a reminder, every time we pass the post office or go to get your mail, think of being that disciple for Jesus and spreading God's word. Will you pray with me? Dear God, please help us to love and serve others, those near us and around the world. Thank you for allowing us to be part of your great plan. Help us to share the good news and spread your love to one another. Thank you for your love. We love you, God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our prayer of illumination this morning. Lord God, our hope comes from the gospel, the word of the truth that you bring to us. May it bear abundant fruit in our lives. As we grow in faith, help us, tru truly, help us to truly comprehend your grace. O oh God, help us understand this amazing grace as we seek to lead lives worthy of you, O oh Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please stand. This morning is from Deuteronomy chapter 30, verses 11 through 14. Now what I am commanding you today is not too difficult for you or beyond your reach. It is not up in heaven so that you have to ask, who will ascend to heaven to get it and proclaim it to us so we may obey it? Nor is it beyond the sea so that you have to ask, who will cross the sea to get it and proclaim it to us so we may obey it? No, the word is very near you. It is in your mouth and in your heart so you may obey it.
Discipleship matters. It matters to Jesus Christ, and so it should matter to us, every one of us. Last week, we began a series of messages on the Great Commission, and Dawn gave us a great analogy with the children's message of, of us serving the Great Commission. Go out and spread the news, just like a mail carrier. So we talked about last week, those are our marching orders. Jesus said those words. Go baptize and teach are the main three theme, the three main themes in the Great Commission. As the body of Christ in this world, that's our responsibility. So one of those most important verbs in the Great Commission is make disciples. We're to make disciples. And after reviewing the true characteristics of a disciple of Jesus Christ, you may feel that you're not even close, or you may feel like you've achieved at least some of those characteristics as a true disciple. So today we want to talk about your and my passionate commitment to Jesus Christ. What does that mean in our daily lives? Passionate commitment to making disciples. Are we fans of Jesus Christ only, or are we followers? There's a difference. We have discussed and learned from the Great Commission that to make disciples, we are instructed to go baptize and teach, as I mentioned. Now, this may sound to some of you like you can never do any of those things, any of those actions in any way, shape, or form. However, I would suggest to you that you are thinking of those actions in only one way. Go baptize and teach. There are many, many, many ways to do all three of those actions. So let me open this up even bigger and mention some specific characteristics of a true disciple of Jesus Christ. These come from a few sources, mostly theologians or pastors or church leaders who have gleaned these characteristics from God's word, from the Gospels. A disciple is passionately committed to Jesus Christ. They have an extraordinary love for people. They have a heart to serve. They are aware of and available to the Holy Spirit. They are guided by the authority of God's word. They live morally pure and they are bold in telling the good news. Those are just a few. They're also engaged in biblical community, biblical community like this one, right? They are generous. They live their lives with purpose and on a mission. That's a few more characteristics. So this morning we will learn that a disciple is passionately committed to Jesus Christ. Let's begin by reading together Jesus' difficult words in Luke chapter 14, verses 25 to 35. Hear God's word. Large crowds were traveling with Jesus, and turning to them, he said, If anyone comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even their own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. And whoever does not carry their cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. Suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Won't you first sit down and estimate the cost to see if you have enough money to complete it? For if you lay the foundation and are not able to finish it, everyone who sees it will ridicule you, saying, This person began to build and wasn't able to finish. Or suppose a king is about to go to war against another king. Won't he first sit down and consider whether he is able with 10,000 men to oppose the one coming against him with 20,000? If he is not able, he will send a delegation while the other is still a long way off and will ask for terms of peace. In the same way, those of you who do not give up everything you have cannot be my disciples. Salt is good, but if it loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is fit neither for the soil nor for the manure pile. 
it is thrown out. Whoever has ears to hear, let them hear. Would you pray with me, please? Lord God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing and acceptable to you, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Wow. Talk about setting the bar high from Jesus' own mouth. I must admit two things to you right up front today. First, this passage is one of the most difficult for people to hear and to understand. And second, the characteristic of a disciple that I reviewed earlier, some of those, are also difficult to hear for all of us. But I want to remind us of something else also. Jesus never promised us this life or this faith would be easy. And his second promise was, it's even better for us because he promised to never leave us or forsake us or allow us to walk alone on this journey of faith to becoming a true disciple. Upon reviewing this list of characteristics, I quickly realized that it's not only hard to hear for me, but I also realized that I fall short on most of those. So for the next few weeks, I thought we would go over some of them, considering the Great Commission in light of the Great Commission, to help us better understand what a disciple of Jesus Christ looks like in the 21st century and how we might all grow into those characteristics. Passionately committed to Christ is the first one. Wow. Passion is defined as a strong feeling toward something or an emotion that motivates beyond normal living. As humans, we are passionate creatures in lots of ways, right? Think about that. What's your passion? We can be passionate about our sports teams and our hobbies. It doesn't matter if the Pittsburgh teams are losing. We quickly become passionate about how terrible they are. It's passion. We can be passionate about our politics and our pets. We can be passionate about music or making money or pizza or ice cream. But consider what would happen if we were just as passionate about following Christ. How would your daily life be different? I once heard a church member, this was several years ago, say in the middle of one of the Pittsburgh Steelers playoff runs, that tells you how long ago it was, (laughs) on Monday morning he said, my life will be the same, no matter what the Steelers do. It really doesn't affect my life when they win or they lose. The big picture stays the same, and so does the small picture in my life. I remembered him saying that, obviously. And I'm suggesting to you today that both the big picture and the small picture of your and my life will be different, much different, if we are committed to Christ passionately. They both will change, the big picture and the small picture. The commitment to making disciples as a follower is a whole different level of passion and commitment than anything else we're passionate about. Not necessarily harder, just different. Remember how we used the analogy of commitment last week, right? with eggs and ham. Anybody remember that? The chicken is involved, but the pig is committed. By the time of our first verse in Luke 14 that we just read this morning, wherever Jesus went, there were large crowds. He was developing a following. He was becoming known, and the crowds were becoming larger and larger. Some estimate the crowds in this passage were in the thousands. They were traveling along with him by this time. And it was a mixed crowd. 
Many were simply fans. They wanted to see him do something magical, or they wanted some more bread, or they, they just enjoyed seeing him confuse or confront the religious leaders. They liked that, some of them. But there were also some in the crowd that were true followers, that same crowd. Could you tell the difference just by looking at them? No, not at all. It's the same today. In fact, it's exactly the same today. There are many fans of Jesus Christ. They go to church, they're good people, but they are not true followers. Here's a list of some of the differences. See if you realize these differences between fans and followers, either in yourself or in others. A fan believes Jesus is Savior, but lives to please themselves. A follower believes Jesus is Lord and Savior and lives to please God. A fan exalts their own opinions, feelings, and thoughts above the Word of God. A follower exalts the Word of God first above their own opinions, thoughts, and feelings. A fan seeks to know God through religious ritual only. A follower seeks to know God through a personal relationship. A fan follows God as long as everything is going well in their lives. A follower follows God regardless of their circumstances. What's another name for a true follower? A disciple of Jesus. Remember that a disciple is simply a follower of Christ, one who follows his teaching and his commandments. Even if they fail or stumble, they continue to follow his teaching. They get back on the horse. They get back on the journey. In our reading today, Jesus turns around and addresses the crowd. And what he says is mind-blowing for in these individuals, this crowd, as mixed as they were, and shocking to us if we have ears to hear. We often call these verses one of the hard sayings of Jesus. There were several. It's not hard to understand. It's difficult, though, to live it out in our own strength. A disciple loves Jesus more than any earthly relationship. That's what he's saying. Now wait just a moment. Is this any way, Jesus, to grow your crowd of followers? Well, as a matter of fact, yes it is. But it will not grow your fans. When you say hate your father and mother, brothers and sisters, siblings, friends, that's not going to grow your fans. Nobody's a fan of that. It will grow your followers if they understand your next words. First, notice that he said, before those words, he said, if anyone comes to me, if anyone comes to me, this is the call of salvation that is available to all, anyone, regardless of who they were or what they had done before. It doesn't matter their age, their cultural background, their race, their gender. The invitation is open to anyone to be his disciples. It's the same for us today. He invites anyone and everyone to be his disciple. But next, Jesus sets the terms and conditions of discipleship for us and for them. We're all invited, but there are some guidelines. There's some expectations. And secondly, are we really supposed to hate our families? Come on, Jesus, wait a minute. I thought the fifth commandment tells us to honor our father and mother. Exodus 20, verse 12. And doesn't Ephesians teach husbands to love their wives as Christ loves the church? That's Ephesians 5:25. And didn't you say for us to even love our enemies and pray for those who persecute us? Aren't you, those your words, Jesus? And doesn't Paul write that if you don't care for your family, you are worse than an unbeliever? 
That's in 1 Timothy. See why these verses are hard sayings? What could Jesus possibly mean by this? Well, I happen to believe and I have experienced that the best interpreter of scripture is scripture. Right? So take out your Bible. There's Bibles in the pews. Take out your Bible and turn to Matthew 10, 37. Matthew chapter 10, verse 37. And I think what Jesus is trying to say here will make more sense to us. Everybody get to Matthew 10, verse 37. Let me get to it. Matthew 10, verse 37. Anyone who loves his father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Anyone who loves his son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. That's pretty clear. That's pretty straightforward. But the question becomes, do you love Jesus more than your son or daughter? Do you love Jesus more than your spouse? Do you love Jesus more than your friends? He doesn't say, do not love your friends, do not love your spouse, do not love your mother and father. He says more, love me more. He's saying that compared to your love for him, that is so superior and so supreme, every other relationship will look like hate. Does that make sense? In one way that makes sense. That's hard for us to understand a little bit, but it makes sense. Do you remember what Jesus told one law expert when asked what the greatest commandment is? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And then he said, and the second is just like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. Friends, if we are passionately committed to Jesus, if he is our supreme treasure, then we will actually love our parents, our siblings, our spouses, and our children better than we did before. This is true even if that relationship with those people is much different than our relationship with him. So here's again is the hard question for all of us. Do you love Jesus more than your spouse, more than your kids, more than your parents, more than your future plans, more than your life itself? A true disciple follows Jesus by taking up his or her cross. We just sang about that. Whatever that cross may be, just imagine the people in the crowds trying to wrap their heads around this, the thousands of people that were merely fans of Christ. And then Jesus continues by dropping this truth bomb on them. He says in verse 27, and whoever does not carry their cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. In all of these verses, difficult verses, and we've only covered a few of them, what is Jesus saying to them and to us today? He's saying that we are to die to ourselves, to the world, to our old way of life, and follow him. And that means to live as passionate, committed followers by working to follow the Great Commission to make disciples. Does this mean we need to sell our house and live on the street in a tent? No. But it does mean that you become a steward of all that you have, including your house and your job and your car and your friends. Your time, your talent, your treasures, all your stuff belongs to him. We're just stewards of it. 
We own a lot of stuff in this culture, and sometimes our stuff owns us. Don't let that happen. And if it happens, change it. Ask God for help to change it. You and I need to change that as we become true disciples. I want to close this morning with a prayer that's titled, The Fellowship of the Unashamed. The Fellowship of the Unashamed. It's from a book entitled, Words Aptly Spoken by Dr. Robert Moorhead. According to Dr. Moorhead's son, there was a man in Africa who was murdered for his faith, and he had a copy of this prayer with him when he was martyred. Listen to these words carefully. I am part of the fellowship of the unashamed. I have Holy Spirit power. The die has been cast. I have stepped over the line. The decision has been made. I am a disciple of his. I won't look back. I won't let up, slow down, back away, or be still. My past is redeemed. My present makes sense. My future is secure. I'm finished with low living, sight walking, small planning, smooth knees, colorless dreams, tamed visions, worldly talking, cheap giving, and dwarfed goals. I no longer need preeminence, prosperity, position, promotions, plaudity, or popularity. I don't have to be right, first, tops, recognized, praised, regarded, or rewarded. I now live by faith, lean on his presence, walk by patience, am uplifted by prayer, and labor by power. My pace is set, my gate is fast, my goal is heaven, my road is narrow, my companions few, my guide is reliable, and my mission is clear. I cannot be bought, compromised, detoured, lured away, turned back, deluded or delayed. I will not flinch in the face of sacrifice, hesitate in the presence of the adversary, negotiate at the table of the enemy, pander at the pool of popularity, or meander in the maze of mediocrity. I won't give up, shut up, let up, until I've stayed up, stored up, prayed up, paid up, preached up for the, for the cause of Christ. I'm a disciple of Jesus. I must go till he comes, till I give and till I drop, preach till all know, and work till he stops me. And when he comes for his own, he'll have no problem recognizing me. My banner will be clear. May we all realize that Jesus is taking us by the hand in this life, and leading us to become true disciples, true followers of him. Take someone else by the hand. Help them to become a committed disciple also and live out your commitment to Christ and the Great Commission. Amen. In our prayer time, we want to continue to pray for all of those joys and concerns on our hearts and minds, including people, places, circumstances, or our own discipleship even. So what are they today? Karen. Did you say Nashville? Lots of places. <laughs> okay.
Thank you. Oh, go ahead. Oh, nice. Very nice. Everybody wave to Corey. Enjoy your time at camp. Thank you for all of those. Anyone else? Mary Laura. Ninety-fifth. Oh, we have to sing. We're going to sing happy birthday. Is that okay? It's better that you didn't hear. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Laura. Happy birthday. Anything else? <laughs> Anyone else? John. Uh, first for Paige, uh, his test is Hopefully the symptoms will be mild. Good. Good. This too shall pass. Crystal. Be sure to tell him they would want him to be in worship, no matter how tired he is. Samuel was so excited to see him. Great. Great. Anyone else? Thank you, Gloria. Let's take all of our prayers to God. Lord God, we come to you today in prayer because you have promised to hear us always and to listen to us and to answer us in your way and in your time. But Lord, today, how are we ever going to be your disciples? We are overwhelmed by the needs of this world, the cries of people, who feel threatened by others, those who are in need, those who are in danger, those who are alienated, ring in our ears and in our hearts on a daily basis. Sometimes we would just like to run and hide, hoping that all this turmoil and conflict will go away. But it doesn't. It sits outside our doors and waits for us to do something. Lord, God, help that something to be our commitment and our service and our compassion for others. Help us to remember how you have forgiven and blessed each one of us, how you have called us blessed and beloved. Jesus reminds us in today's scripture of the commitments of a true disciple. You know our weaknesses and our strengths. You know our distractions. Help us to use all of these things for your glory. We are called to reach beyond our comfort zone to those in need, to the alien, the injured, the lost, the lonely. It's difficult for us to do and we need to feel your powerful presence with us. Bless us again, O oh Lord, with a good measure of courage and strength that we may truly serve you. Bless those whose names and situations we have brought before you today for healing, for hope, and also in thankfulness and gratitude for the blessings that you've given them and us. 
Lord God, it's in your mercy and love that we are to help reach out to others as you have reached out to us. So Lord God, be with those in worship today across the world. Send your Holy Spirit to be with them that they would be strengthened to make disciples wherever they go and wherever they are. Lord God, we thank you for the joys that we have expressed. We thank you also for the concerns because it lets us know that we depend upon you and that you always are dependable and faithful in helping us and serving us and growing us into your disciples. Lord God, today, as we celebrate the Lord's Supper and communion with you, strengthen us to go out into the world and do these things in your name. For it's in your son's holy name that we pray all of these things, saying the words that he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, this is the joyful feast of the people of God. We know that people will come from north and south and east and west to sit at God's table in his kingdom. We also know that Jesus' closest friends, his disciples, did not recognize him when he reappeared to them. It was only after he broke bread and shared the cup that their eyes were opened to who he is. May our eyes be open this day to the presence of the living Lord. So just as Jesus offered his thankful praise to God, we should offer our thankful praise as well. The Lord be with you. you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Please pray with me. Father God, almighty, creator of heaven and earth, it is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you. You have made us one from every nation and people to live on all the face of the earth. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending song. Holy, holy, holy Lord God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your son Jesus Christ by the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection. You gave birth to your church. You delivered us from slavery to sin and death and you made with us a new covenant by water and the spirit. He commissioned us to be his witnesses to the ends of the earth and to make disciples of all nations. And today, this church family joins with others across the world to celebrate at his holy table. And so in remembrance of your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice. We are in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of our faith. Christ has died, Christ has risen, Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and cup. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ and one with each other and one in ministry to all the world. 
until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, almighty God, now and forevermore. Amen. On the night that he was betrayed, our Lord and Savior took bread, and after he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Those who are with me will never hunger. Those who believe in me will never thirst. The body of Christ given for you. In the same manner, our Lord and Savior took the cup, and after he had given thanks, he gave it to his disciples and said, Take, drink all of this. This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me.
are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. The blood of Christ shed for you. Jesus said, whenever you eat this bread and you drink from this cup, you proclaim the saving death of the risen Lord until he comes again. Please join me in the prayer after communion. Loving God, we thank you that you have fed us in this sacrament and united us with Christ. Send us out in the power of your spirit to live and work to your praise and glory. For the sake of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. <clears throat> Friends, giving is one of the most wonderful things that we can do as Christians. Because when we give our money, or our time, or our talents, the opportunity cost is not just a few minutes of singing, it is the very life, labor, and future that our liquid capital and our time and talents represents. It is a show me, don't tell me moment of worship where we let go of the security and or pleasure that all of those things can purchase or give to us to demonstrate our worship of God and our love for his mission. The gospel is free, and the only thing we would like to receive from you this morning is your prayerful and open heart to give as you decide to give. So please join me in a prayer for all of our giving whether you give here in the sanctuary, by mail, or online on our website. Let's dedicate our gifts. Gracious and loving God, we come to you today wanting to be your true disciples. And as disciples, you have modeled for us giving to others in lots of ways with your time, with your presence, with your blessing, and all that you had to give, even your life. So Lord God, help us to follow in those ways and give of our time and talents and our treasures. These gifts today we ask to dedicate to your glory so that all may come to know you as Lord and Savior. We ask and pray all of this in your name. Amen. Please join me and stand if you are able in singing our closing song, I Surrender All.
Now go forth into the world in peace. Be of good courage. Hold fast to that which is good and overcome evil with good. Strengthen the faint-hearted, support the weak, honor all persons, and go and love and serve the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you, remain with you today and always. Amen.